glad that you showed up. Hey, you guys are nuts. Man, isn't this just amazing to come and worship God together and just, ah, uh, awesome. da. I don't know. Woo! Good stuff. It's just when, it's not that God, it's not that God gets any bigger because he's as big as he's going to get. It's not that God gets any more real or gets any more good than he already is. He's about as good as he can get. He doesn't grow in goodness. He doesn't grow in, in how awesome he is. He doesn't grow in faithfulness. You and I grow in those things. He doesn't grow. He's already perfect. What grows is our awareness of these things. We grow aware of His presence. He's already omnipresent. He's everywhere. It, it's not that, 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 that His presence grows. It's that we become more aware of His presence. Become more aware of how big He is. It's not that His goodness grows. It's that we become more aware of how good He really is. And it's just awesome. It's awesome to get to experience that with you in this place for such a time as this. Let me tell you what, God is lining up things and God is positioning things and He's positioning people that as we move forward as a church and as we take this next step together and as we continue with the momentum that God has created, that we're going to move forward exactly the way He wants us to, where He wants us to. And let me tell you, lives are going to be changed because there are people who are willing to reach beyond what is comfortable, reach beyond what is easy and show people that they matter to God because they matter to us. Amen? That's what loving God, loving people, and serving the world is all about. It's not just a catchy phrase or slogan. It's something we've got to internalize, and it's something that we've got to believe, and it's something that we've got to put legs to and make more than just something we say. Amen? Amen. And we're going to do that. We're going to move forward with that, and, and I'm just so excited about the things to come and the things that are, and I know that God's got great things for you and your family, and I know you're growing, and I know that you're maturing in the Lord and maturing in His Word, and that you're beginning to understand His Word uh, in, in a clearer way so you can apply it in your life and you can begin to share it with others, and it's just changing us from the inside out, day by day, moment by moment, step by step. Amen? Amen. Isn't it good? It's good. It's, it's crazy, man. Hang on just a second. I've got to take a drink of water. If you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write this down. Overcoming intimidation. I'm talking about intimidation because intimidation is something that all of us face when we decide to take a step forward. It doesn't matter what that step is, there's going to be something that's going to rise up because the enemy hates progress. Absolutely hates it. And so when he hears about things moving forward or when he begins to see that the same old trick and the same old cycle isn't working anymore and we're taking a step away from those things and we're beginning to see things broken off of our lives and cycles that maybe have been, been repeated generation after generation in our families or mentalities that are being broken or habits that are being broken or chains that we've carried from one relationship to the other or baggage that we've carried, those things begin to fall off or we begin to move forward as a church and accomplish more for the kingdom of God. God. The devil doesn't like that, but I like what the devil don't like. I'll let you think about that for a minute. I like what the devil don't like. And if he doesn't like progress, if he doesn't like me moving forward, then I'm just going to surround myself with moving forward and momentum and growing in grace, growing in his goodness, growing in his truth, growing in his mercy and understanding more about God, understanding how big he is and how big his love is for me and how much he wants me to reach out and love other people. Amen? Amen. But when you decide to take that step, it's not always the easiest thing. Because as soon as you want to take that step, intimidation just immediately rises up. Boom, it wants to be there because it wants to squash you from moving forward. But how you process that conflict, how you deal with anything that would try to keep you from moving forward is crucial. And this morning, I want to show you from God's Word how we can overcome intimidation as a church and as individuals so we can continue to move forward through any challenge that we may face. I want to tell you about the children of Israel, God's chosen people. And these guys were in Egyptian slavery for 400 years. And that was not God's best for them, not God's desire for them. It's through their own foolishness and through their own poor choosing that they became enslaved by the Egyptians. But God uh, raised up a leader called Moses who came in and actually led them out of Egyptian slavery and Egyptian captivity. And they saw freedom that they hadn't experienced in generations. But that wasn't the end. It wasn't just freedom. God just doesn't set us free just for freedom's sake. No, He sets us free because He has a purpose for us. And God said, I've got a purpose for you guys. I've got something in store for you. I've got this land. 
It's this promised land that I've given you where you're actually going to plant down roots and you're going to actually grow and multiply and you're going to thrive and you're going to be a place in all of the earth where people know that I am good, where people know that, that, that I love you. And so I want to plant you in this land and I'm calling it the promised land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. And so the children of Israel began to tr- go on this trek, on this journey, looking for this promised land that God had promised their father Abraham many, many years ago and it was promised to these people who had been in slavery for 400 years. And as they went on the journey, they saw the faithfulness of God because they made a lot of mistakes on that journey, and it took them a lot longer than God ever intended on it taking. Matter of fact, they got hungry, so God feeds them. He rains bread from heaven. It's called manna. They got thirsty. He began to allow water to flow out of a rock and to begin to give them something to drink. Their enemies were on their tail, and we're going to seek them to destroy them. And God parted the Red Sea so they walked across on dry ground. Every time they were met with an obstacle, God showed how faithful he was and showed them, I'm leading you step by step by step in this journey. And I'm leading you somewhere. I've got a purpose for you. I've got a plan for you. But intimidation, every time they tried to take a step, intimidation would want to come and would want to cause division or would want to cause uh, them to get discouraged or to throw their hands up in the air and quit, often like it does in our lives because it's God's leading us step by step. Sometimes we think, God, where are you? Is anything ever going to change? This is so hard. This wall is so big. There's so many things I have to overcome. It seems so intimidating. And it would want to discourage us from continuing to move forward or beginning to trust in ourselves instead of trusting in God. But as long as we keep walking with him step by step, we understand that God is going to give us the victory, that he's going to give us what he promised he was going to do. But we have to trust him in every step of the way, just like the children of Israel had to. But they got to the edge of the promised land. And Moses said, okay, guys, we're going to check this thing out. We're going to make sure that before we go in, that we do this right. Because the land is occupied. It's not just a vacant piece of land with a Century 21 sign out in the middle of it. This area is now known to us as modern-day Israel. And still to this day, a piece of property that is no bigger than the state of New Jersey is the centerpiece of the world. Think about how often you hear about Israel in the news. Think about all of the surrounding countries that are surrounding a state, a, a, a country that's no bigger than the state of New Jersey. But yet because all of these countries that are ten times as big as it are surrounding this little place, they're constantly attacking. They're constantly wanting to take over this land, but they can't have it because it's promised to God's chosen people. And God's protecting His people. And that's why it's so important that we align ourselves with Israel. It's so important because they are still, that promise that God made to them thousands of years ago is still intact today because His promises are true. His promises are forever settled. Amen? Amen. And so no matter who wants to come against Israel, no matter how big of an arsenal they want to come against them with, no matter what the threats, no matter what the intimidation, that's the land that God promised them. But at this time, it was occupied by other people, and they were supposed to take this land. And so they come up to the very edge, and Moses says, okay, guys, let's send out some spies. And he says this in the book of Numbers, chapter 13. So I want you to go there with me. Go to Numbers, chapter 13. And we're going to look in verse 17. What he did was he actually got uh, all of the 12 tribes of Israel together. Uh, Some estimates that theologians have is that this was a group of well over a million people. So we're not talking about a couple hundred thousand people. We're talking about a lot of folks. And there were 12 tribes within all of these people. And Moses chose a representative from each one of these tribes. And he said, okay, before we go into this land to take it, I'm going to send you guys out as spies in the land. And you're going to check it out and see what's going on because we know the land is inhabited. So here's the thing. Numbers chapter 13 and verse 17. Let's pick it up. Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. He said to them, go up this way to the south and go to the mountains. See what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, or whether they're few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests or where there's no forest. Um, Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now was the uh, time for the season of the first ripe grapes. So if you go in and you see a bunch of grapes and you see that things are well, we know that there's a lot of good things going on, and this is not a desolate land. This is a good land. So he's going to send out all of these spies. And because God gave them a strategy, God just didn't say, okay, show up and go, um, uh, excuse me, um, Mr. Uh, Amalekites that are inhabiting the land and, and, and Mr. Hittites and Jebusites and all you other ites and termites and all you guys that are inhabiting the land. Um, do you mind? I mean, it's no, not a problem. Um, God kind of said, it's kind of embarrassing, but God said this is ours. Would you mind kind of moving out of the way? Um, that's not how it worked. 
They had to take a strategy. God gave them a strategy. He just didn't say show up and everything would be better. But a lot of times you and I just want to show up and we want God to fix everything and make it better. And we don't understand that God not only gives us victory, but he gives us strategy because there is no victory without a strategy. A lot of times you and I want to say a prayer and then we sit back in our comfortable chair and wait for God to show up and do everything for us. We say, God, I need out of this financial mess. I need you to fix this for me. And so we say a prayer and we'll weep and cry. And then we'll go, okay, that's done. Now I'm just going to wait on the victory. You see, in between the prayer and the victory is a strategy oftentimes. Now, sometimes God does some amazing things and he will bail you out of situations that you are in the big, ugly middle of. But more often than not, God gives us a strategy that will lead us to victory. You see, we'll say things like, God, fix my finances. Well, we need to learn how to be better stewards. So maybe that means that the step for us is going to a class like what we had with this link group of learning finances or hearing some good financial advisor like Dave Ramsey or someone to learn how to better properly manage our money. And maybe that's a step for us that God is leading us into to lead us to the victory that we want. Hello, somebody. Because God knows that if he just bailed us out and let us win the lottery or that we got this big check, check dropped off in our mailbox, then it wouldn't be six months down the road or maybe six weeks or maybe six hours we'd be in the same predicament we were in because we need to grow. So God wants to lead us step by step and we never need to underestimate the significance of a step. We never need to go, okay, God, I need you to fix this because, oh, let me tell you, God, it's bad. God knows it's bad. He knows where you're at. He cares about you, and he's wanting to lead you step by step into victory, and he leads us step by step in relationships. He leads us step by step with our children. You don't just say, God, I want to have good children, and, but yet you never take a step forward to be able to parent them in the ways of the Lord and raise them up in the ways of the Lord. You see, we got to understand that there's no victory without a strategy. It's not just show up and take the land because it's yours. No, it's, you've got to have a strategy. But the good thing is, is that you and I don't have to come up with the strategy. We can trust God for the strategy in every step we take. Amen? Every step we take, we can trust God that he's giving us a strategy. And he had given Moses as the leader of the children of Israel a strategy to go out and to spy this land out. See what's going on with this thing. Now, for us to move forward... We've got to believe that God wants us to succeed. We've got to believe that if he's given us a strategy that is going to be leading us in the way that we're supposed to go. And then he's not just throwing us out there and just, I hope this works. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I've got a few ideas. Uh, Moses, let me run these past you. What do you think? I don't know. No, if God's leading you in a step, then it's a step for your benefit. Amen. Because his desire is for you to succeed. His desire is for you to walk in victory. His desire for you is to move forward with the momentum that is being created in your life. But you've got to trust him not only for the victory, but for the steps to get to the victory. Oh. A lot of us, we don't like process. We don't understand process. We want to put it in the microwave. And we want to pull it out. How many of you have ever had a microwave dinner that compared to something that was slow cooked and you would have said I prefer the microwave dinner if that's you we have counseling classes available because you've got issues that I can't even begin to articulate we don't like process sometimes we don't like taking time but when we do isn't the quality so much better you know it takes 16 hours to produce a Honda, but you know it takes six months to produce a Rolls Royce. The difference is quality, the difference is time, the difference is detail. And sometimes God does amazing things where we get to go from A to Z, but don't neglect it. More often than not, we see God giving strategy, God giving steps. You know that God anointed David as king over Israel when he was just a kid that was taking care of his dad's sheep that smelled like sheep. It's just little David out there stanking, smelling like sheep, coming in. Whoa, David, you smell like sheep. You need to go get in a bath. Oh, son. Here he is smelling like sheep, but yet he gets anointed as king over Israel. Now, all of a sudden, did he get magically transported to this throne? Oh, I'm now the king over Israel. Did it happen that way? No. He got chased around by Saul. He faced Goliath. He had to deal with things in his own life and his own heart. Over and over again, step by step by step, God was leading him. God was taking him. He just didn't immediately take him. And, and, and so David understood God as a God of process, even though he was anointed as king, even though God had already said, you're the guy. Even though God had already said, here's the victory, here's the purpose, here's the plan. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> 
That's interesting because when I was preaching in the first service, somebody's phone went off and it was playing the dun 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 and I was like, yeah. So I was just wondering what was going to happen in this service that would, you know, be the equivalent. So it was just that God moment, that that light bulb. Somebody just got an idea in this place. But you know, God gives a strategy. He leads us step by step. There is no victory without the strategy. See, if we never take a progressive step forward, then we'll just simply attempt to maintain where we already are. And there's nothing wrong with maintaining for a season. Because sometimes we need to, you know, begin to strengthen some things. And we need to begin to tighten some things. And there's nothing wrong with maintaining for a season. But you don't want to stay there. God wants to take us higher. He wants to take us deeper. He wants to take us further. He wants us to do more for His kingdom and become more aware of our purpose day by day by day. He doesn't just want us just to stay on this just plane forever. He wants us to grow. Amen? Amen. But you see, when you're gaining momentum and when you're taking ground, you're always working against something that's bigger than yourself. And intimidation always wants to rise up. So here's the children of Israel. They've got this strategy. They're going to go out and spy the land, and they're going to see what's going on. But we've got to believe when we're moving forward, step by step, we've got to believe that when we take that step that God wants us to take, that what we're doing and why we're doing it outweighs any obstacle that we face. We've got to have that so deeply internalized in us that what we're doing and why we're doing it outweighs any obstacle. Anything that may try to rise up its ugly head and discourage us or keep us from keeping on, right? We've got to believe it's got to outweigh it. It's got to be so deeply internalized in us that it outweighs whatever obstacle that we may face. Now check this out. In Numbers chapter 13, let's pick it back up in verse 22 and let's see what happened with these spies. They went through the south and they came to Hebron, Ahiman, Seshai, Talmai, and the descendants of Anak were there. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Then they traveled down to the valley of Eshkol and they cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes and they carried them between two of them on a pole. They also brought some pomegranates and figs and the place was called the valley of Eshkol because of the cluster of which the men of Israel cut down there. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. So this wasn't just some weekend trip. These guys were out there for 40 days. They were spying out this land. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron, all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought word to them and to all the congregation. They showed them the fruit of the land. They told them and they said, we went to this land that you sent us to. And listen, it's exactly what you said. It's exactly what God told us. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. Here's the fruit. Check this out. Verse 28, nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. Cities are fortified. They're very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains. The Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses. He said, let us go up at once, take possession, for we're well able to overcome this. But the men who had gone up with him said, we're not able to go up against these people, for they are stronger than we are. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they spied out. And they said, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. We saw the giants, the descendants of Anak that came from giants. We saw those guys and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And that's the same way we were in their eyes. We were grasshoppers in our own eyes and we were grasshoppers in their sight. The descendants of Anak was there. The giants were there. (laughs) But you see, nothing great has ever been accomplished without having to overcome a challenge. Amen? Nothing great has ever been accomplished without having to overcome some sort of obstacle that would try to intimidate, that would try to get you to get stuck in your place, get stuck in fear. You see, challenges are a good thing. (laughs) Challenges are a good thing because they require us to step out in faith and trust in something bigger than ourselves. The problem is, is that too often when we face those challenges, we often magnify our problems and the negative things that we face. And we look at how much we're going to have to overcome. We see the sons of Anak. They're giants. We're just little guys. And they're big guys. Oh, no. And we magnify our problems. They said we're like grasshoppers in their eyes. Well, apparently, 
There weren't too many giants in the land because if that's the case, when you went in as a spy to try to blend and be among the people, all the giants would have said, hey, who's all the little guys? So apparently not everyone was a giant. And as we further get into this story, we learn that the sons of Anak, yes, they were large men. They were giants. But guess how many there were? There were two. The Bible names them. Later on gives their names. But yet we see two giants and we think everybody's a giant. All the men there are huge. Oh, and there's no way we can overcome. We saw the sons of Anak there. There's two big, huge guys. And there's no way we can overcome it. And here you are, a nation of over a million people, but more importantly, a nation that has God on your side. And then they said, what about all these other people? What about all the the, the Amalekites and the Jebusites and the Canaanites? What about all these guys that are everywhere? Well, here's the beauty of this. God is giving you strategy. He's trying to show you his purpose because the beauty of all of these ites is that guess what? All the ites fight. They don't like each other. So you don't have to fight all of them at the same time. They're not going to buddy up and go attack you. Matter of fact, they're going to get real excited the first time that they hear that you destroyed one of the other nations. And then they're going to get a little scared when you take the next one. And then they're going to get scared when you take the next one. And then all of a sudden, they're going to go, oh no, they're coming for us next. See, God gave them strategy. He was trying to show them, you don't have to take all of this at once because I'm leading you step by step by step. But you've got to believe that what you're doing and why you're doing it is going to outweigh whatever battle you face, whatever challenge you face, whatever obstacle will try to intimidate you. And Caleb got a hold of that. When he went out there, he was one of the ten spies as well as Joshua that gave a good report. But there were ten guys that magnified the problem and only Caleb and Joshua were the guys that said, let's do it because God said we can do it. You see, when we face challenges, when we face obstacles, the natural tendency for us is to want to look at all the reasons why we can't. Look at all the reasons why we shouldn't. Look at all the reasons that are intimidating. But let me tell you something. If God said to do it, if God said to take the step, if God said it's time, if God is leading you and guiding you, then you need to trust in Him and believe that He's got your back and your front. Amen? Amen. You see, in reality... We've got to understand that no matter how big our obstacles are, how big the challenges are, that our God is bigger. And if we're going to overcome intimidation that would try to hold us back and slow us down, we must not magnify our problems because here's what we've got to do. We've got to move forward with conviction. We've got to move forward with conviction. It can't just be a good idea that we're just going to try out and just hope it works. No, it's got to be something that we're deeply convicted about, something that we believe internally. We've got To move forward with conviction. And that means that our reason why will help us fight and weather any storm that tries to intimidate us. Amen? Amen. Just like Caleb. Caleb said, whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on a minute. We're well able to overcome this. Let's go up at once and take possession. Let's go do this, guys. Because we're well able to overcome them. Because don't you remember, this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our forefathers. The God that said, this land is ours. We've been in Egyptian slavery for most of our lives. We were born into this stuff. This is all we've ever seen. It's all we've ever known. It's what grandma knew. It's what grandpa knew. It's what great grandma knew. It's what great grandpa knew. And this is all we've ever seen. And now we're free. And now here we are at the edge. And you're wanting to tell me we're going to give up now? No. Let's go up immediately and take it because God said we can. We've got to believe that what we're doing and why we're doing it is so internalized and so strong within us. And we've got to trust that God is on our side, that we just continue to move forward and not allow intimidation to hold us back. Amen? Amen. See, the right changes in our lives and the right changes in our church that God is leading us into are going to produce fruit. And you're going to be able to see the fruit of those things. But here's the thing about fruit. It doesn't always sprout out immediately. It doesn't always sprout out immediately. The first time you take a step, the first time you say that prayer, the first time that you apply scripture, the first time that you step out in faith, it doesn't always happen immediately. But I will tell you this, that patience and conviction being led step by step will produce fruit. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but it will produce fruit. Amen? Because God is faithful. Because God is true. When I was in Mexico, I was talking to Jerry McNally who is the missionary there and the, and the pastor as well over the church. And he and I got to spend some one-on-one time together. And we just connected in such a way as leaders. It was amazing. Uh, we immediately just dropped down any type of walls 
And we just got right into the nitty gritty. And he was asking me, how do you handle these situations? How do you do in these things? And I told him, and then I said, well, what about this? And we just began to get real just deep with each other real quick. And we ended up talking almost all day long. We spent six hours together, and then we spent another six hours together because after the first six hours, he said, I'm getting hungry. Let's go to dinner, and let's keep talking. And we kept on talking, and we weren't talking about Mexico. We weren't talking about the orphanage. We weren't talking about anything, well, just, just leadership stuff because here was the beauty of it is that as we were sharing, I just breathed a sigh of relief, and I said, you know what, Jerry? I said, the greatest thing about talking to you is that as a leader, sometimes you have to make decisions that aren't always the easiest or aren't always the most popular, but you make them out of conviction because you know you're making the right decision because you're looking at what's best for everyone as a whole and you're trying to move forward as a leader and hearing you share some of the stories and say some of the things that you're saying makes me feel like I'm not crazy. Isn't it good when you can talk to somebody like that and they let you know, hey, I think that way or I've processed things that way or I've had that feeling or that experience and you feel like you're not the only guy out there? Oh, man. That was such a relief for me as a leader. Just say, I said, thank you for being a regular guy. <laughs> thank you for thinking that. Thank you so much. Because he and I learned that we value a lot of the same things and that we have a lot of the same thoughts as leaders and pastors and about the kingdom of God. And, and as I was sharing my heart with him, he said, that's exactly right. And I would just bounce off of him. And I was like, man, this is great. And it's so good to see that. But you don't always see the results from when you make those decisions after you make the decision. Sometimes you make decisions for your children that they do not understand at the time. Amen? But later on down the road, they learn that you really did have their best interest at mind and they begin to understand. Sometimes we make decisions in our lives that God is leading us in. Steps that don't always make sense to everyone else because sometimes God's strategies are crazy. Hey, it's never rained before, but I want you to commit the next hundred years of your life to trusting that it is going to rain, and I want you to build a boat. Okay. <laughs> I'll do that. Sure. Why? Because I trust you, God. Don't you think that Noah came across some people that were trying to intimidate him, that were trying to get him to stop, but he had to move forward with conviction because he understood what he was doing and why he was doing it. It was so deeply internalized in him, and as you move forward in your life, you've got to move forward with conviction. As we move forward as a church and as God leads us into the next steps that we are to take as a church, we've got to move forward with conviction. It just can't be a good idea. It just can't be something novel that we're just going to try out. It's got to be something that we move forward with conviction because we want God to order our steps. Amen? We want God to lead us step by step by step. And we want to trust Him in the step we're in now and we want to trust Him for the next step that we're to take. And we've got to do it with conviction. It's got to be internalized. When we say love God, love people, and serve the world, it's got to be internalized in us. That's why we'll get outside of our comfort zone. That's why we'll step out and do something for someone with no strings attached because we love them and we're showing them that they matter, even if it makes me uncomfortable, even if everything inside of me screams intimidation that would want me to, get, that would want me to stop, that would say, well, what if? What if this doesn't happen? What if it doesn't happen this way? What if this doesn't happen? And you step out regardless because you're convicted with it and you know why you're doing what you're doing. And you know it's time to make a move and it's time to step forward. Because we're moving forward with a purpose and with conviction. You see, if we keep our why, our reason, our conviction at the forefront and we believe that God is our source and we believe that He's worthy to be trusted, if we seek Him for our strategies and allow Him to lead us step by step, then momentum will grow and increase in our lives as we walk in victory, as God leads us to the next step in our lives as God leads us into the next step as a church. Because God has been doing some amazing things at Word of Grace. People have been getting saved left and right. All of a sudden, just salvations, week after week, people coming up to me, week after week, sharing testimonies and stories about how they're getting uh, awoke to certain things in their lives that, the, that has been laying dormant, or that purpose is coming alive in them, or that they did this or did that. They reached out and they served this one or served that one. And I'm hearing all these individual stories, and I'm seeing what's happening. I'm hearing these stories of these people in Mexico, and I'm getting to see God have this cohesive team come together, and these people are doing life together, and these people are, 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 are being mentored by one another, and they're iron sharpening iron, and they're growing, and they're being discipled, and they're serving all in the context of loving God, loving people, and serving the world. And they're growing deeper. They're doing more for God. 
than they ever thought. And what we're going to do, church, is we're going to move forward with that heart, with that idea, and we're going to move forward and take the next step in growing and loving and reaching and showing people that they matter by growing deeper in God's Word, by growing stronger together, by developing those relationships, by beginning to grow hand in hand together as a church as we move forward. Amen? That's what God is calling us to do. And the momentum is heading in that direction. And, and it's not just because the church has grown into tenants, which I thank God for that. But the end goal is just not to fill the seats in the auditorium. Amen? Amen? It's to see hearts and lives impacted by the power of the Word of God and by His Spirit in such a way that it causes drastic change in us, that causes us to do things that are just weird and not normal because we're trusting God in this step as we move forward because we believe people are worth it and the love of God has just so impacted us that it is causing us to value what God values, and God values people. God loves people. And because we love God and His love's impacted us, now we're loving what He loves, and we're serving and we're giving and we're doing things that we never thought we would do before because we're moving forward with conviction. That's what God is calling us to do as a church. And Word of Grace is moving forward with conviction, with strategy, and with purpose, being led step by step, by the voice and by the hand of God. We're moving forward together. We're entering a new season of growing momentum that God is leading us as a church into. And this next step, like many steps that we have taken as a church, as well as in our personal lives, will not be without obstacles or things that will try to intimidate. Because there will be things that try to rise up and will try to intimidate you. They'll try to knock you out. The enemy hates progress. You look at where we're at. Look at this facility that we're in. You see, we had to be led step by step by step to get where we're at. You know, when we started out as a church, it was just a group of people that just met in a home. And then that changed into a group of people that met in the American Legion building. Matter of fact, the pastor came in after those that would meet in in the building would just have their parties and the place would smell like alcohol and the pastor would have to clean it up so they could have church there on Sunday morning. And sometimes the church members would walk in with the smell of alcohol. Pastor did his best to try to clean it up, but I've heard stories of those that were there. And then after that, God moved us into the next step where we moved into what's now the Remax building there in Falls, where we were serving God and worshiping Him there. And then we moved to the other building, which is now the Boys and Girls Club here in Falls. And then all of a sudden the pastor of the church at the time had the vision to reach young people and to reach teenagers. And so he bought a grocery store and a church bought into the vision and believed it was the next step. And we converted an old grocery store into what you see today to reach teenagers. And then all of a sudden the church outgrew the area they were in. And so we moved over here and began having church here. And then having church here was just getting too much. So we had to go to two services. So the pastor at that time said it's time to go to two services. And then when I came, the church continued to grow and continued to build upon that foundation and we said we got to go to three services because there's just so many people and we're just being led step by step we just didn't wake up one day and say hey let's have a church let's have three services and let's have this old building that we're going to turn into a church and boom there it was it was step by step by step it was step by step by step it was obedience by obedience by obedience it was submitting to god trusting him in that season and that time and moving forward And never underestimate the significance of a step. If if you and I underestimated the significance of a step, then we would have given up when we were meeting in somebody's home 20-something years ago. Right? We would have given up then. We would have said, oh, this isn't worth it because it's just a handful of people. But you see, the influence that God has given us as a church to be able to reach and be able to speak into so many lives and to love so many lives and love so many people. And as that influence grows and as God continues to send people here... We want to equip those saints for the work of the ministry so it just doesn't become about us being here, but it, be, it becomes about us taking the word and taking the truth and moving forward and taking it out into this area that God has called us to for such a time as this. We have been called, amen? For such a time as this, we are being equipped. For such a time as this, these things are happening where we're moving forward, trusting step by step by step as we're going to love God, love people, and serve the world. And we're going to show them what Jesus means. Some people will come here and we want them to come here. Believe me, we think we got a great church, amen? And we want people to come here and we want them to fill the seats, but we don't want to just limit the influence of Jesus Christ to a weekend service or to a Thursday night or to a Wednesday night, but we want to take the Jesus that we worship and serve in here and bring that Jesus to them where they're at, both as individuals and as a church. Amen? So we're moving forward 
with purpose, with strategy, with conviction. And we're moving forward, regardless of what obstacle may try to come up, what may try to intimidate. We must believe that God has called all of us as a church to love Him and to show that love to people and to serve the world. We must believe that with conviction, we've got to have that internalized in us. It's got to be a conviction, and we've got to understand it's the reason for what we do. So next week, I'm going to finish this series, and I'm going to give a strategy that God has put on my heart as the pastor of Word of Grace to kind of lay out for you what this next step is going to look like as we move forward as a church. So please don't miss next week. We're going to show others the love of God without strings attached because we believe people are worth it. We're going to have ways to bring them here, but also like Jesus, we're going to go to them and reach them where they're at. We're going to show others and not just talk about showing others, but we're going to show them that they're worth something to God because they're worth something to us. We're going to love them right where they're at and help them to know that they can serve a God who loves them right where they're at. We aren't just trying to get people to attend services on the weekend or throughout the week. We're going to bring them, we're going to bring Jesus to them together as a body of believers in Jesus Christ, mobilized with a purpose and a strategy that believes serving others both in and outside of the walls of this building is important because we understand our why. We understand the reason why. And our reason why will help us overcome any obstacle we face together as we move forward, loving God, loving people, and serving the world. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Maybe you're here in this place, and you would say, Pastor Derek, I hear you talking about loving people right where they're at. And I've never experienced that kind of love before. And I need to give my heart to Jesus Christ this morning. Let me tell you, this is the most important decision that you will make. Maybe God is dealing with you right now. And maybe you've never felt valuable. You've never felt loved. But all of a sudden you're beginning to feel something. That's the love of God. That's the Holy Spirit lovingly trying to nudge you and say, it's time to come to Jesus. It's time to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. It's time. It's time to stop running from the problems and the issues and stop trying to figure it all out on your own. It's time to start trusting Jesus. It's time to stop feeling like you're worthless because of the mistakes you've made and the things that other people have said to you or even things that people have done to you that aren't fair and they're not right. But because of those things that have been said or done to you, you feel worthless and you feel like you're just no good. But God says, you're valuable to me. You're so valuable to me that I sent my son to die for you. That's how valuable you are. And I want you just to accept him today and receive him and believe that He can make all things new, that He can heal those wounds, that He can forgive, that He can make the things that were wrong in your life set right again, that you can walk in victory, that you can walk forgiven and healed and whole, that you can live this life with a purpose and not just float aimlessly trying to just accumulate whatever you can for yourself. But you can have a purpose that's greater than yourself. You can overcome obstacles and challenges. And I want to help you and lead you and guide you But first, all you've got to do is just come to me. You've got to come to me and believe me and trust me that when I say those things, that I mean them. And maybe you're here in this place and say, Pastor, I'm ready to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord, the leader of my life, and my Savior, my Redeemer, the one who makes me whole. And if that's you, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to stand up or come down here. But while everybody's got their head bowed and their eyes closed, I simply want to make this invitation that you acknowledge that that's you by lifting your hand and putting it back down. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hands. I see your hands over here on the side. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? I want you to acknowledge that. This is, this is something between you and God. You are acknowledging this. And you're saying, I need Jesus. Anyone else in this place? I see your hand over there on the side. Hands been lifted all over this place today. Probably the most hands lifted out of all three services in the weekend. Because God is doing something awesome in this moment. This is your time. This is your moment to come to Christ and to get things in your life made new. And you do it simply by believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth. And so I want to lead you in that kind of confession. But you've got to believe it in your heart for it to have any merit. Because it's not just the confession that saves you. And it's not just even just believing it in your heart. The Bible says that we must believe in our heart and confess. So we confess out of our mouths because we believe in our heart. So today I want to lead you in a simple confession and let this be a part of what you believe in your heart. 
And Jesus Christ will make all things new in your life. And he'll help lead you step by step by step to walk in victory and get momentum moving in your life. So would you say this prayer with me, everybody? Would you just join in to let them know that we're supporting them and we, we're believing God with them and thanking God for them for this decision they're making today. So let's pray this prayer together. Say, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I believe what you did on the cross was good enough to forgive me of my sin and to make all things new, to reconnect me to God, to His grace, to His love, to His mercy. So thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross, for forgiving my sin, for making all things new. I commit my life to you. I say you're my Lord. I say you're my leader. And I'll trust you every step of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen.